Today we'll be covering uh, our first kind of operator that uses data and operates on data. Uh, we'll we'll be diving kind of deep into kind of a, a standard uh, and Boolean and operator. Uh, the reason for the deep dive is that it exposes kind of some features of delay and sensitivity and of the handshake uh, where we have some wiggle room uh, and that's where this idea of of having an early out comes from uh, effectively if we already know the answer to the out to the output we don't have to wait for the other inputs before admitting that uh, and so things can kind of rush ahead and then go back and wait for the inputs so let's jump in um, so boolean and the chp is is basically it's a for loop we receive on both a and b and then we send out the boolean and of the two input data and so to start kind of deriving a the simplest form of this we're going to start with our standard wchb we have uh, our channel r and our channel l uh, both data lists at the moment and so we're going to uh, go back to our one of two four phase encoding, uh, where we have two valid states, one for zero, one for one, zero representing false, one representing true. Then we have a neutral state uh, on the reset phase of our handshake. And so when we uh, kind of going back to uh, the lecture introducing uh, delay and sensitive data encoding, we can apply that to this WCHB shuffling and get a data WCHB uh, pipeline. And so this just, you know, you, you still have L, you still have R, but uh, kind of following that lecture, we now have data on that, uh, on those request rails. Um, and so we're going to expand upon this to add N, A, and B. Uh, we're going to be kind of relying on our, uh, on the material that we covered for multiple requests. So we're going to take uh, this uh, we're going to start, let's start with the true, the true rail, right? We're going to take the uh, request for the true rail for A and B. And we know that uh, the output uh, will be true when both A and B are true. And so this is uh, kind of a straight application of uh, Monday's lecture. But when it comes to the false rail, we run into some difficulties. Uh, so normally with synchronous logic, you would just kind of say uh, a.f and b.f, or sorry, a.f or b.f. Uh, but the problem with that is we, if, if a.f is true, then this will run ahead and ignore b. It won't wait for b. And so you, when you get to uh, lowering le, le will be able to lower before b maybe is received, causing an instability, right? And so there's some extra precautions. All of our logic not only has to uh, compute the data value, it also has to ensure the validity of all the input channels, which means that one of the two input request wires for each channel has to be high, right? If we go back to our data specification, we need to make sure that both inputs are in one of these two valid states. Now, that validity check is dependent upon your encoding. So it's only because we're using a standard one hot, one of two encoding that we're checking that one of the two input request rails is high. And so this means that we're gonna have to adjust this expression from a.f or b.f to looking at all the possible combinations, right? So A is false and B is false, or A is false and B is true, or A is true and B is false. Does that expression make sense? It makes sense, but that seems like a lot of transistors. It is a lot of transistors, and there are, we'll eventually get into different ways to handle all of this. Um, but yes, this is one of the great downfalls of self-turned circuits. It's why they're often twice as large 
as a synchronous circuit. Actually, now I think about it, that's only a three high stack, but that's still a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of transistors, but it's a it's still a reasonable stack at the moment. All right. So then we have to figure out the reset phase of the false rail. Uh, and the thing is that the false rail, any of the input transistors and, sorry, any of the input request rails could be high following the output false rail going high, which means that if we want to wait for our two input channels to reset, we have to check everything. We have to check that the false rail on A is low, that the true rail on A is low, that the false rail on B is low, and that the true rail on B is low. And that's where the stack link kills us. And once again, this is one of the great downfalls of self-time circuits. Um, so then we have to handle the input enable. And as before, uh, we can, can use a shared node. And so you know, we set up a, a wire fork and wire that into the enable for A and the enable for B. So that's our first approach. To a Boolean AND. Now, we have five PMOS transistors in, in series here for RFF. That's not acceptable. Um, on any modern uh, uh, technology, that will basically be useless. So we need to figure out ways to handle that. Also, we need to figure out ways to reduce the number of transistors on the uh, forward request line for R.F. How do we do that? So let's take a look at uh, the upgoing rule for R.F and take a look at maybe handling early out. So it's the same CHP. Uh, it's going to behave slightly differently. So we take that big expression for our output request on the false rail and we cut it back down to A.F or B.F. This means that R.F will go high as soon as either one of those input request rails goes high. And that also means that before we lower LE, we need to ensure that the other one has also been raised. And so that's where we get, we can move that validity check down the, the handshake to the input requests, sorry, to the uh, input enable line. And so instead of checking validity in the output request gate, we're checking validity in the input enable gate. Now the stack length for this pull down is reasonable. It's three, uh, three transistors high, except now that input enable is a C element. Uh, it's no longer combinational. And so that adds two more gates in our handshake, as you might expect, right? So we'd have to have some, you know, L neutral drive underscore LE drive LE uh, in order to make sure that we fit the satisfizer, the keeper in our handshake. Uh, so and that's, that's the second approach. It's a little faster uh, on the forward latency, a little slower on the cycle time. But we still have that issue with the long transistor stack on the pull down. So let's figure that out. So if we go back to our base uh, implementation where we check validity in the output request rather than the input enable, um, we can derive, we can start to handle this giant PMOS stack. And so the way we do this is that we actually split up R.F into multiple gates. So we take this giant expression and we break it up into, into three different signals. One for false, false, one for false, true, one for true, false. 
And now we need to kind of propagate that through the rest of our circuit. And so our reset rule will be split up into three different rules. One for false, false, one for false, true, one for true, false. And our input enable, uh, we can then take these three internal nodes and use them to generate the output request with the combinational gate. Basically, if any one of these uh, kind of internal requests goes high, then we can raise the output request. Does that transformation make sense so far? Okay. So then we need to handle LE. It's kind of handled already by checking RF. However, there, there's now an extra gate between uh, the output request on, say, FF and LE going down, right? So the cycle time is now longer as a, a side effect of going through this R.F gate. And so we can kind of short circuit that by using those internal requests to drive LE rather than our R.F signal. And so that cleans up the stack length for kind of our downgoing R.F rule. So those are kind of multiple ways to implement a WCHB and gate and uh, pipeline stage. And if you think about the other reshuffling that we know, P PCHB, you'll remember that PCHB, the, the pull down rules don't have this problem where all of the uh, input requests and neutrality checks get shoved into the PMOS stack. In PCHB, your enable is the only rule in the pull down. And so when it comes to complex kind of arithmetic logic, you generally want to use a PCHB reshuffling. And one of the examples, one of the exercises in this lecture is a PCHB version of this, uh, should we want to. So let's jump over to the first exercise, and I'm going to give you some leeway in what you decide to implement from this. So here we are, we're in lecture eight. I'm going to start up the command line interface. And let's take a look at example one. And so example one, we are going to implement a, a WCHB and we're not going to use early out. We're just going to uh, start with the base case. And we have three channels, two input. One is A, one is B, one output on R. They are both E1 of two as defined in channels.act. Uh, so E1 of N is defined here with, with D being the output requests, so D0 and D1. We also have this C1 of 2 to help for, say, underscore R, if you want to use that. It is just uh, a collection of data rails. So it's, a, it's like a delay insensitive encoding for data without the enable signal for the channel. Uh, we have our source and sync that that produce and sync random values and we create a source for a a source for b and a sync for r and everything is connected up to the bottom when doing the method where you're splitting out into the false 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 true and true false signals um are you going to have three c elements there essentially or can you just use those as inverted and then feed those directly into our D0 plus? You'll have three C elements there. Um, as we get further into the course, there are timing assumptions you can make. Uh, remember your question last time about the keeper and the forward inverter being kind of left out of the handshake. Yep. Uh, that is actually called the half cycle timing assumption. And 
if you make that timing assumption, then yeah, you can just kind of have the status sizer off to the side there. Um, but we'll we'll get that we'll get into that kind of more in depth later. Uh, for now, it's I, I mean either way, it's three C elements. It's just whether or not you include that output converter in your handshake. So we're going to implement the uh, simple version that has a reasonable stack length and doesn't use early out. We have our PRS body, g.vdd, g.dnd, as we always start with. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, WCHD reshuffling uh, between A and R. So we have R.E and A.D0 uh, underscore R.D0 down. And then underscore R, not underscore R dot D zero, R dot D zero up, R dot D zero, A dot E down, not R dot E, and not A dot D zero. So this is just a standard WCHB. To give us a little structure. Okay. Now, we do want to declare our internal nodes. We know that there are two, so we're going to have C1 of two underscore R. And that gives us our definition for underscore R. Then we want to replicate these uh, output request rails for R.D0 and R.D1. So let's do that. And we're going to do it down the handshake. Okay. So now we've got a standard WCHB buffer, four phase, one of two. And we want to add in B. So we know that we can do the true rail pretty quickly. That'd be and B dot D1. And then down here, and and not B dot D1. We need to alias this uh, input enable. So we can create that node. For LE and assign A.E and B.E to LE. Okay, that gets us a little further. So now we need to handle the false rails. And so if we just kind of start from the beginning we have an, uh, or b dot d zero right, and that's that would be our early out, but this breaks, so we want a dot d zero and b dot d zero or a dot d one and b dot d zero or a dot d zero and b dot d one, right? That's our delay insensitive logic. In which case we'd have to acknowledge all of that on the downgoing. So and not a dot d one, and not b dot d zero, and not b dot d one. But we want to split this up. So let's do that. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we will have um, our. Let's just split this into a c one of three. For underscore r and then we can have pool underscore r let's call it three um actually we can just do c1 of four for underscore r and then a c1 of three for our uh other nodes so so this would be r uh zero 
Okay, so let's fill out our internals. So the first one is this needs to be moved to underscore R3. This needs to be moved to underscore R3. And this needs to be moved. The next thing we want, we want to do is take this and break it up into three separate gates. One for zero, zero, one for one, zero, and one for zero, one. And that will fill out um, RFD1, RFD2. And we need inverters for all of these. And so this will be under this will be R0 dot D0, R0 dot D1, R0 dot D2. Okay. Does that make sense so far? All right. So then we need to do the same thing for this. We break it out into separate separate gates. The first one checks A0, B0. The second one checks A1, B0. The third one checks A0, B1. And this is going to be underscore R dot D zero, one, and two. And we need to replicate this. So it would be R zero dot D zero, R zero dot D one, and dot D two. Finally, we need to uh, create the gate for R dot D zero. So we have R0.d0 or R0.d1 or R0.d2. So any of these uh, initial, you know, 0, 0, 1, 0, or 0, 1, any of those contribute to the false rail going high. And so we'll need an underscore R1. I'm oh, sorry, underscore R0. And then we'll need to use that to drive R dot F high. So not underscore R zero, R dot D zero high. We do the same thing on the other side. So we replicate the combinational side. So we uh, not R zero dot D zero and not R zero dot D one and not R zero dot D two underscore R zero up. And if that goes high, then R dot Z zero goes low. Finally, we have this node R dot D zero, which we need to replace with R zero. Okay, that's our handshake. I probably made some kind of mistake somewhere in there. At the bottom, when you're setting LE to high, you have four PMOS in a stack. Shouldn't we be increasing the size? Uh, we should. Um, it's a lot of sizing to do. So normally, uh, Normally, you don't use the default sizing. You size every gate just so that you have control over that. Um, I typically use templated sizing so that I can size up the whole process after I'm done if I decide to. Uh, but for now, we're just going to use this. We're just going to size this one gate and call it uh, four times PN times PN as discussed in the previous lectures. We can do the same thing here, so three times PN times PM. Okay. 
So let's do reset. All of our forward driving rails need to be reset low. So that's standard WCHB. We use g dot underscore s reset and for all of these. Then over here, we need to force these rules to fire. So that'd be not g dot underscore s reset four. For all of these. All of the rest of these gates are combinational. And that means that they will be set to a valid value as long as your state holding elements are reset properly. And so you don't need to think about reset for them. So let's see if I made a mistake. Let's save this and call make E1. PRSIM B1.RC, or sorry, dot PRS, source PRSIM.RC. Uh, sorry, source E1. Let's see. It looks like I didn't make a mistake. Uh, generally, you want to run the cycle for a while to just verify, because because this is a random simulation, it will it doesn't necessarily explore every state. However, it's random in such a way that it will often run into problems quickly. So you do need to simulate it for a while to make sure that you've covered every base. Um, let's take a look at the analog simulation. I'm going to let it run for a while so that we get we can see what's going on. Here view test that's by here and and we're going to have a bunch of signals here. So let's break this down a bit. We have our input requests. We have our input requests for B. We have our shared input enable. Then we have our, let's see, let's use the internal nodes. So we have our internal node for, for false false, our internal node for true false, and our internal node for false true. And then we have our, uh, true true rail and we can see the effect by pulling in our um a dot false or b false rail and then we have all the internal nodes of the c elements that we can look at and the internal node of the combinational gate. So what is going on here? In this first token, both A and B are true. And so we see uh, R.D1 go from zero to one. And our input enable goes low as a result. Notice the false rail is not triggering in this token. And so it's just our true rail. In the next token, we have false, false. And so we see uh, r0.d0 go high. And that represents the false false case. And then we see that drive 
r dot d zero low, or sorry, r dot d zero goes high. In token three, we have a false true case. And that drives r dot d two rail high, right? So this is our uh, false true case, which drives r dot d zero high. Uh, so let's close this down. And there is a, a little bit of a discussion that I want to have about E1 here. Now, this is a quasi delay insensitive process for ostensibly a really simple operation, right? Boolean and. And it requires a lot of transistors. So clearly, quasi delay insensitive logic, self time logic, is really bad at handling data. Although, you should also note that we can get some pretty interesting control behaviors. And so, in general, what I found is that it's most efficient to use QDI logic to implement the control behavior that you want, and then use a signal in the control to clock your data path. And that is called bundled data. Unfortunately, the tools for validating bundled data circuits aren't, don't really exist, right? So there are standard synchronous tools for validating clock pipelines, like prime time, but there aren't the requisite tools for validating bundled data pipelines. So you can build bundled data pipelines in ACT. There are uh, timing assumption flags that you can add to the beginning of production rules to do so. But in essence, what's happening is you're no longer validating the clocked part of the pipeline. So I just wanted to add that note that yes, QDI logic is bad with data. And you'll see this even worse if you try to implement anything that has an XOR in it, particularly because of the acknowledgement requirements. If you are interested in looking up and researching bundled data, the first place you want to go is Ivan Sutherland and his work with micro pipelines. We won't be covering bundled data in this class or in this course. Um, it is a whole nother course in and of itself. All right. Exercise two. So in exercise two, we're going to implement the same and process, Boolean and, but this time we're going to use early out. And so be it with the PMOS stack for being long, we'll just size it up and forget about it. So this version will have early out. We start with our production bud. We attach BDD and ground. And again, I'm going to start with just a standard data list WCHB between A and R. So let's I'll write that out real quick. Thank you. 
Okay. So now we have our data list of ECHB. Let's add data lines in. So we're going to replicate these. D1, RD1. RD1, RD1. Or R.D1, ED1, RD1. All right, so there's our you know, like a standard WCHB pipeline. Now we need to add in B. So we know R.D1 goes high when A.D1 is high and B.D1. And let's add that on the other side too. And we need to add our internal node definition. So C1 of two underscore r and then also bool le for the input enable and we need to attach a.e to le and b.e and then le is driven low and high okay so the next step is our forward driver for the false rail because this is early out, we're going to just OR in B .D one, or B .D zero, which means R.D0 will go high if either of these input requests go high. But before we lower the input enable here, we need to wait for all of our input requests to be valid. So in the case of r.d0, we need to wait for a.d0 or a.d1 and b.d0 or b.d1. So that's just saying before lowering le for r.d0, verify that a is valid and that b is valid. Problem is that that makes this no longer combinational. And so we need a couple more internal nodes so that we can leave room for our state holding element. We'll call it uh, LA and underscore, uh, or I guess L underscore LA and then LA. So this will be underscore LA down, not as for LA, LA up, LA, LE down. And where E in this case stands for enable, A stands for acknowledge, which is the inverse of enable. Uh, it's a question of where you put the inverter. Uh, so you can actually make uh, self time handshakes where instead of having the inverter on the uh, enable, you push the inverter back to the incoming process and you your channel is an A102. So it's just, right, where do you put the inverter? So here we have underscore LA up and then that drives LA down which drives LEI. Okay. So we'll be driving reset for our two output request rails. Oh, I forgot. Uh, on this, we need to wait for all of them. So we need to wait for and not a dot d1 and not b dot d0 and not b dot d1. So they're all being reset here before r0 is reset. And that's a, an extremely long PMOS stack. 
I'll play around with that in a second to see if we can move around, but for now, we'll leave it that way. So for reset, we're gonna use our standard WCHB reset. If we reset our two forward drivers low, then we know that R.D0 will be low here, and R.D1 will be low here, which will disable this rule. So we don't have to worry about fighting this. And then here, we know that this rule will be enabled because these are both low. So all we have to do is reset our four drivers as we usually do in WCHB. So that would be G dot underscore S reset and G dot underscore S reset and to prevent the downgoing rules from firing and then G, not G dot underscore S reset or to, to force our upgoing rules here to fire for the internal nodes. And so for now, let's just size this up and ignore it. So this is what, five PMOS in series? Five times PN times PM. And this is three, three times PN times PM. Just so we don't have to deal with the horrible transitions. Okay, let's see what happens. Maybe I messed something up in this. We'll find out. So we'll call make E2. And let's check the digital simulation first. Here's him E1.PRS, or sorry, E2.PRS, source, here's uh, E2.RC. Cycle. All right, no instabilities. That's a first. Um, when implementing this, I always mess it up in some way. So let's check the analog simulation. Here's him in v.prs, source, here's in rc. I'm gonna let it cycle for a while so that we have something to look at. Here view, test.spy.prm. Again, we have a lot of signals here. So let's break this down a bit. We have our input request on A. So that's A dot, so that's A false, that's A true. We have our input requests on B, so that's A, that's B false and B true. We have our shared input enable. <clears throat> then we have R dot E zero, so that's R false, and R dot E one, R true. And then we have RE. And let's take a look at our internal nodes as well. Underscore RD0, underscore RD1. And finally, our underscore LA and LA. So let's zoom in a bit. And let's look for a case where false came in. So notice that false on B goes up here before any rail on A. And our output goes up in response to that before waiting, you know, without waiting for that other rail to be high. And so I'm sure there are there's a more explicit example of this. Let's take a look at this one. So here, well before the false rail of B, the false rail of A went high and the output went high as well, the output request. And so we can keep finding examples of this that are kind of more and more egregious. So, this one, for example. Here's one where well before we uh, we get a, a response from A, we are able to send an output on R before receiving that input. So that's 
early out. Um, and it is useful in many places. In particular, this technique has been used to construct a self-timed ripple carry adder. Now, because of the long PMOS stacks, instead of using the WCHB reshuffling, they use the PCHB reshuffling, uh, but they use early out for the carry. And so average case performance, it's, um, it's latency for a 64 bit adder is actually log M, which is the best you can get for an adder. And it's a ripple carry. Now, normally ripple, ripple carry latency is uh, ON. And the self timed version of that is ON in the worst case, but on average, it ends up being log N. Now, the frequency for the self timed 64 bit ripple carry is, this, is unaffected by the number of bits in the ripple carry. And that's because the operating frequency is determined by each individual process. And because all of your data is not coming in in parallel on a single enable, you have individual enables for each bit, you end up having an operating frequency that's independent of length, carry length. So this early out is actually very important for performance. Um, and we'll see in the next lecture a uh, kind of standard, standard ripple carry full adder implementation in WCHB. Um, and we'll walk through an example in PCHB as well. But for tonight and uh, leading up to Monday, I leave as an exercise for you guys to implement this AND unit in PCHB rather than WCHB.